Y'all ready to rock? Hosses. I'm Chris White, and I wrote and directed a coming-of-age music movie set in a world that, while very real and important to me when I was a teenager, is more on a foreign planet or alternate universe to most people. This past year, we've screened Electric Jesus, a comedy about a group of heavy metal missionaries in the summer of 1986 at dozens of film festivals across the United States. And we're just about to release the film everywhere. Audiences have bonded with the characters and the story, but more than a few have asked questions about the music and the subculture that produced it. Electric Jesus, the music behind the movie, is your VIP backstage pass into this crazy world. And in the immortal words of Skip Wick, our Christian rock huckster with feet of clay and a bad toupee, the rock and roll road show. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Episode 5, Rocking the Flock, with special guest, Michael Bloodgood. John, they always tell you when you're writing uh, writing fiction uh, to write about what you know, to start from a place, a world that you know. And uh, when I was writing Electric Jesus, uh, I tried to follow that advice, and I did know about evangelical Christian youth culture, but I had no idea, I had no understanding of what it would be like to be in a band, let alone a Christian metal band. Do you have any, I mean, do you have any experience in being in a band? I think you you are in a band, yeah, right? Yeah. You've played. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I I'm, I'm not, wasn't never a metal band. We were more of an alternative garage rock kind of band. But back then, man, you were just, if you're playing rock and you had long hair and you were either doing um, rock music or you weren't. And I was a fan of extremes <laughs> i was a fan of extreme music <laughs> and yes um this the our guest today was definitely somebody when their first record came out uh it got my attention the album cover the name it was definitely mm -hmm. something that stopped you in your tracks and the sound was uh was not what you were used to hearing certainly yeah. in the christian world um but uh when i saw them play which i believe the first time i saw them play was at cornerstone it had this theatric um i mean their stage set even looked like a castle mm -hmm. and it, it was very dramatic and uh yeah i'm really excited about this and blood good just for people who um are going to listen to the podcast now and then track down all the blood good music and listen to the band they were heavy so so mm -hmm. they were yeah. they were not in the more poppy glam metal kind of idea they were they were for real you know they yeah they were the, more in the, the judas the priest was iron maiden kind of yeah, world yeah, yeah. right Right. Yeah. And so, um, they, um, and yeah, the lead singer legit. had, had ex Broadway experience and his, his, uh, or his p presence was definitely fit that, uh, bravado and, uh, dramatic flair. And so the band was, f was heavy and Les Carlson, the lead singer, had that gravitas and the package even if you weren't a metalhead was very very impressive so and michael bloodgood who we're going to get to talk to today um when i was even very young and just getting started with true tunes and really didn't deserve a whole lot of uh special attention was always somebody that took time to talk to me and encourage me and, and we became friends um when i was very young and there was something uh, very special about the heart that these guys had um they were also probably um right in there with resband when it came to their maturity they they had a mm. uh, there was a lot there were met there were some metal bands out there that were kids you know and these guys were adults they knew what they were doing their heads were screwed on straight you know um the band 316 in um the movie electric jesus is really um it's not based on any specific band but it I think at least some of the music and a lot of the ethos of that band is is definitely inspired by this amazing Christian metal band called Bloodgood. Let's head into the interview suite uh, with uh, Michael Bloodgood of the band Bloodgood and hear what it was like for real to be in a metal band talking about God in the 80s. <laughs>
You're the you're the bass player, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're the only band that's ever been named after the bass player, maybe. Yeah, that that could be right. That would be a good trivia question. Yeah, no kidding. I'd, I'd say we go with that. That's where we lead this thing off. I'd like to start our conversation back in. Uh, I think the band formed officially formed in '84. You guys were out of Seattle a few years before grunge, but there was still an actual music scene and a metal scene there. Um, I'm assuming you were just playing rock and roll. Were you a Christian at the time? Or what, when, did, when did your musical pursuit turn into something about Jesus? Very early on, actually. I got saved when I was a senior in high school. I kind of dropped out of my cover bands back then and uh, didn't really want to do anything for a while. And then when I got into college, my first year of college, I formed a three-piece band called Crossroads, you know, original. And we started just going out playing. And we were playing, you know, I mean, we didn't, there, wasn't really, there wasn't really any Jesus music at that point. I don't think Love Song had even come out yet. So we're just kind of, we're taking hymns and trying to work them out. We're doing some cover tunes, like Jesus is just all right. Just coming up with something to play at these coffee shops and churches where we found ourselves playing. So I've been basically playing Christian rock since, man, 1972. Well, help me understand what it would have been like in that moment. I mean, coming out of sort of that Jesus people, essentially what we'd call a revival, I guess, that's happening. Coming out of the 60s and a lot of these people just kind of finding Christianity in an authentic way. And then how that merged into, well, let's just start singing songs about God, like, how did that, how did that happen? I was a young believer and I found myself going, well, how am I going to relate what's happened in my life to my friends without being, you know, just sitting on a street corner with a Bible or something like that. So that's what, you know, know, my friends and I decided to put this band together. Well, let's let the music do it. So that's when we started that whole deal. So it was, uh, it was just a way to us to communicate our life change to the people around us. You know, so we started playing, you know, we played at the NTC, the Naval Training Center down in San Diego, you know, Sunday after Sunday, you know, we did coffee shops. There's a lot of coffee shops happening back in the, this is kind of the tail end of the Jesus movement and parks. And, you know, we go to church, although some churches didn't care for us very much, but we went to churches, you know, so we just kind of, wherever we got an opportunity, we, we just grabbed a hold of it. And that was our way to, you know, where do you use term like evangelize? Because we didn't know what the term evangelize meant. We just wanted to share with our friends this life change that happened to us. So that's how it kind of came about. In those days, and then as as Blood Good, as you started playing uh, metal and more, um, you know, aggressive, uh, going into more theatrics too in the stage show and everything, who, who were you more interested in playing for? Uh, a, a church show or like where you knew a bunch of Christians were going to be or where like a club or something where you knew nobody's going to be a Christian. I mean, like in your gut, what, what did you get more nervous about <laughs> before you went out to play? Uh, we were definitely with blood good. We were trying to reach the loss. So we didn't really care. We, our whole career, we very rarely played a church. I can count on one hand the amount of churches we played. So it's always clubs, arenas, festivals, whatever. So our, our, our target audience, especially at the very beginning, was just non-believers. Because, you know, the Striper had just come out, and they were garnering a lot of publicity, this whole thing, how can you be a Christian and play metal, or who's going to be interested in this? So we, we kind of were in that same kind of a mindset. So that's where we wanted to go. We just wanted to, we wanted to reach the loss. It wasn't until years later that we began to realize, well, we've got a lot of Christians in our audience, and so we started doing some music more about the Christian worldview, that sort of thing. But uh, our, our thrust has always been evangelism. When did you make the jump, though, from the from the Jesus music uh, stuff you were doing to metal? Like, it seems like a pretty big shift from one to the other. What was the thinking there? What was the progress there? Well, honestly, uh, it was very done in innocence because I was already involved in a band. Uh, it was my college band called Cypress. We've been together for seven or eight years at that point. Uh, and then, you know, Rick Stone, who's a good friend of mine, was in a band called Service Man. The two of us just said, let's start praying that God would raise up a band for these metal kids. Because I was working at Bandstand East, which is a rock and roll store, and all our clientele were metal. You know, we had we had just a bunch of, you know, hard rock, heavy metal bands coming in. I said, man, who's going to reach these people, you know? 
you know, Rick and I started playing. God, you know, lift up somebody to, because I, I wasn't interested in doing it. I was already fine. I was I was busy. I was married. No big deal. And, but as as I began to pray specifically more by myself, uh, it, it got more of a, a passion in my own life. Like I always I I think that God's calling me to do this. And I go, well, I'm not a metalhead. I'm a Beatle guy. You know, I, I'm a pop music guy, you know, whatever. And so the more I prayed, the more personal it got. And so I just started researching metal. I went to a local music warehouse, which is a chain that's long since gone, and asked the manager if she could recommend some. Ma so she gave me Priest and and, and uh, Dio and, and Iron Maiden and all the guys were going on at that point. And I just kind of came home and with these cassette tapes and started listening to stuff. Going, God, this is this is phenomenal music. It's so powerful. So I just started praying that God would start lifting guys up. And then JT, our first drummer, he came on. He just got off the road. And so the two of us started praying on Thursday nights. And, and there's a series of about a year and a half. We're just praying about what we could do. Dave Zafiro finally joined us on. So then we started rehearsing. And we're just rehearsing Van Halen tunes or whatever. You know, again, we didn't have any original music at that point. And then when Les finally joined us in 84, uh, he said, no, we're not going to do any cover tunes. Let's do original stuff. So the four of us got together. We started writing our first record, basically, you know, in, in David's living room, wherever we happened to be. And that's kind of how it all came about. You know, none of us were really metalheads per se. Les's son was really into metal. David was a shredder, but he, you know, he's playing in a pop band at that time. So we just kind of conglomerated and kind of created Blood Good to reach these kids. And, you know, I think we did okay. <laughs> it totally makes sense that you, you guys found, you found melodies and songs and you mixed the melody with like that power of, uh, you know, heavy metal. That's really the recipe. Yeah. I mean, any of the great metal still is at the, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pop song, you know, that's, that's dressed up like that. Um, and, and talk a little bit about Les, because Les is quite a character. You found a front man worthy of like a big, of a metal band. How did that come about? <laughs> Well, I had met Les years before that at Bandstand East, and he was coming in to get some gear from Bob Connolly, who was a manager. And, I, you know, we didn't really, you know, we went out to lunch together, and I really liked this guy. I thought he was really great, but he wasn't a believer. And years later, I took out an ad in a local a magazine called Rocket Magazine looking for a singer well-grounded in the word. And so I wish I had a, I wish I had a camera going because it would have been a sitcom to see the guys that used to come into my store thinking, you know, the guy's got a cardigan sweater on. Yeah, I can sing that, you know. Oh, really? I put on Dio, like we, we rock, and I just crank it up, and they just kind of go, you know, and they'd walk out. But it was kind of funny. But Les is the only guy out of all these people that came in answering the ad saying, yeah, I can do that. Okay. So I gave my phone number. He wasn't too impressed with me or what was going on at that point. So he went off and tried to start his own band. But every time he started, it kept falling apart, and he kept hearing my name, Blood Good. Finally, about six months later, he calls me up and goes, man, what's the deal? What's the deal with this blood? Unless you're, you're the singer, man. I mean, I knew it the day he walked into the store, you're the guy. So we all met up together in a, a dive uh, restaurant in Seattle, all the four of us, and we agreed to start the band. I was curious, um, because you guys actually intentionally set the band up as a ministry thing, it wasn't like you were a metal band, yeah. like Sacred Warrior, there was a metal band who then became Christians and kept playing as Christians. You guys set it up to be ministry, but yeah. you were way out on the fringe of what was going on in the culture. What kind of reception did you get from the Christian community doing that kind of music wearing those kind of clothes uh doing those kind of shows what was what was the reception like from the the christian community for what you were doing well uh, you know when you say christian community i always do the quotation marks you know i call it the aryan christians because you know our very first show um we were in uh, lubbock texas and they were lufkin texas can't one of, the, one of those towns in texas and we had all sorts of picketers and protesters we had some had a four and a half foot, five foot sign of me saying I was a homosexual out of prayer life because that's what Jimmy Swaggart had announced to the world right as we we're in the middle, of, you know, starting our tour. So it was very antagonistic. And I say I call them the Aryan Christians because when we would try to dialogue with these people, there was just there was no dialoguing with them. 
you know, we were we were Satan, and that's the way it was. Nobody was open to talking to us. We invited him to the concert. He wouldn't come. We showed him the lyrics on the albums. He didn't want to read them. So they already kind of made their minds or were made up. So we had that following us wherever we went for the first, at least the first two years. It got a little bit more spread. We had a lot of death threats out there. But we just, you know, we just, we just kind of persevered. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, we didn't know any better. When I look at the documentary, I kind of look back and think, gosh, no wonder my parents were worried or whatever, you know. So the reception was not great. Now, we had a few churches, you know, of course, I'm a Calvary Chapel guy. None of the people at Calvary Chapel had any trouble with us. We played C.C. Downey and a couple of Calvary Chapels along the way. But uh, most of those guys, they didn't really have to do us. They didn't really have to do this either. Sacramento Warehouse, they were really cool with us. So there's a few churches out there that were very, very cool with us and had their own music ministry. Can you talk a little bit about uh, people who wouldn't know anything about Christian music probably don't know the significance of Calvary Chapel and, and how the church, you know, in, in various ways nurtured a scene. They nurtured artists and an audience, I guess you could say, and, and maybe even the Sacramento scene too. But can you talk a little bit about West Coast, like how the West Coast, uh, there were communities that were um, promoting and nurturing artists like yourself? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, Chuck Smith, who was the founder of Calvary Chapel, his whole thing was kind of birthed in music. And he started his own label. So you had bands like Love Song, Mustard Seed Faith, all these artists that were just just doing music, just kind of a natural thing, like I said before. You know, when we were kind of in, in the Jesus movement, it was just a natural thing. Nobody thought about, should we do this or what kind of, you know, we just did it. Uh, up here, uh, there's a Calvary Chapel, uh, Wayne Taylor's Church, very receptive. We did our rock theater show there. You know, he, he was very open to it. Uh, you down, down in Sacramento, of course, you had the warehouse. And that, of course, there, that's where Exit Records came out of, 77s, Charlie Peacock. And it, if we didn't play the church, sometimes the church would sponsor it and whatnot. But after you left the West Coast, it was it was like one day we'd be, we would get to Chicago and we'd have, we'd have 1,200 people at the Odeon. You know, we'd sell it out. The next night we're in St. Louis in front of 50 people in a club, yeah. So it's just kind of, so you just kind of got used to the, the topsy-turvy up and down thing, you know, doing what we did. I actually yeah. produced the radio ad for that show at the Odium. I was 16. I had an internship at the radio station, and they let me produce. It was you guys, Messiah Prophet, and one other band, but I got to go in with the tape machine and make it say, like, uh, Saturday, whatever the date is. Blood good. <laughs> make a big explosion sound and i spent probably nine hours producing that ad it was crazy just you know they pl probably played it five times but i was that was that was me <laughs> thanks for that john can you tell me some um some christian bands a couple christian bands that you personally like you were a fan, like you liked those bands, and then maybe a couple of so-called secular bands that you were a fan, like like true fanboy, like I'm buying the, the record the first day it comes out kind of thing. Well, as far as Christian, the funny thing is, we were such, we were such at the beginning of this whole thing that we were on the road. So we didn't get a lot of chance to actually hear a lot of these guys. We got to play with them like uh, Baron Cross, Sacred Warrior, you know, and I became big fans of these guys. Uh, bride we saw along the way, you know, so that's how I kind of got to see him because we weren't really, it's kind of funny, my son's always asked, asked about the 80s, he go, dude, I don't remember much of the 80s because I, I was sitting in a bus half the time, you know, or, or RV or whatever. So uh, as far as the secular bands, you know, I'm a huge, huge fan of Ronnie James Dio. Uh, so whatever, anything that came out of his, I was on it. I loved uh, Judas Priest. Uh, I, I was kind of late bloomer with Iron Maiden. Um, yeah, I've actually seen them since since those days, you know, uh, you know. So, but uh, again, we were so involved doing what we were doing, uh, other than like Alice Cooper, some of the people have been around for a while, that we didn't really get much of a chance to really to grasp onto some of these people. Like, you know, we got to see Def Leppard because we were talking with their management company. So that's how we got kind of exposure was going down and just seeing these guys. But a lot of times we didn't really have a whole lot of, you know, most of my taste, of course, it stuck with Daniel Amos. You know, the, the more you know, eclectic guys, you know, from Chuck Smith's church and all that. Because, you know, when we started out, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of peer pressure. It was us, Baron Cross and Striper, and maybe maybe a, a Messiah Prophet band on the East Coast. So that was about, you know, everything else. Unless somebody gave me a, a tape along the way, I was pretty much on our own, I guess. I don't know. If
How do you feel the the film captured uh, the scene, or if you could imagine a bunch of kids getting together and starting a band in, in 1986 when there was, you know, there, one of them's wearing a Blood Good t-shirt at one point, and they're obviously inspired by Striper. How do you feel that, uh, that we did with that? I think you guys really did a great job capturing it. I was just the whole time watching that film going, dude, this is so much fun. The only thing was hard for me to believe it was in the South, because we could never get a gig in the South. You know, it's just like, that was like the Bible Belt was, you know, we stopped in Florida and then went all the way back to Texas. Everything else, Georgia, Alabama, we couldn't get a gig there. But I thought the manager and the whole, you know, anyway, I thought it was so much fun. But uh, yeah, I think it captured the flavor and the essence of everything and all the band politics. And, you know, it, it's, it was just, it was a crazy time. What would be... You know, and again, you weren't in a, you know, a, a secular band touring on the road at the time, but we all have our, um, you know, the myths and the ideas. I mean, that movie, The Dirt, about Motley Crue goes to, you know, some real extremes of what life with the band would be like, the basic low-grade hedonism uh, that goes on. How was it different being in a Christian band, or, or was it? We were pretty squeaky clean. We took our wives and our kids with us. So it was, you know, we kind of bucked the system that way. You know, rock and roll was so macho and chauvinistic, even in the Christian world. We said, no, I got married to be married, and we're going to raise our kids. So we brought our, my my uh, little son at the time, Paul. You know, now he's 41. But, uh, you know, we raised him on the road doing homeschool, and and uh, David brought his two kids along as well. So we, we just brought our kids with us. We kind of, our, our wives worked very – Marilyn, uh, my wife, did all the concessions – Joyce was our LD and tour manager. So we put everybody to work. And so we just kept ourselves away from that, those temptations, which, you know, would, would have come our way. But we, you know, we just, nah, wasn't for us. So we just stuck with it. It was a family affair with Blood Good. And, and nobody's above that. You know, I'm not trying to cast stones at anybody. Everybody's vulnerable to the excesses of the road. I mean, when you put four teenagers in a bus and send them out by themselves, I mean, people are going to get in trouble. You know, it's kind of crazy when you really think about that scene and what what would happen in those days. Well, and it's also like the the fact is most traveling salespeople, you could be selling dictionaries on the road or, or insurance. If you're on the road and you're away from your normal community of people that hold you accountable yeah. and people that you just don't yeah. want to think you're an idiot, uh, whether it's what we call sort of Christian accountability or just people that that you care what they think of you. You get away from those people and you're anonymous and you're in some town and you don't think anybody knows what you are. That's that's where trouble happens for yeah. everybody. And bands are no yeah. different. It's not like they're special. It's just, that happens with everybody. That's what conventions are for. That's why they that's why they have conventions in, in Las Vegas for crying out loud. <laughs> well, like you say, we always wanted to stay away from that. You know, always wanted to stay away from that. It was just, uh, it was too crazy. And so we didn't, we let us not into temptation. (laughs) It's interesting how uh, Christian metal was so separated from mainstream music. Metal was so identified with excess, and the Christian community that would tolerate metal would not tolerate mainstream music at all. It was like the Christians wanted their music to be Christian. Now, what's interesting is how you go forward about 10, 20 years, and metal, is one of the first genres where Christian artists started to really cross over into the mainstream in a big way. And so a lot of bands from especially the tooth and nail world started to get added to big metal tours and festivals because it seemed to that the music lends itself to songs about struggle and about searching and about confrontation and about strength. What do you suppose were the was the basis of that need for metal 
music to be totally separated, Christian metal to be always Christian, and with the exception of Striper staying in a, in a separate world back then. Striper was always the exception to the rule because they were a mainstream act on a mainstream label. I know Baron Cross tried to get into that, but they didn't really quite, you know, it was a little bit late, or I don't know, maybe, you know, the record label wasn't that interested. We were very fortunate in ours, you know, we, we had uh, a really good, aggressive uh, retail outlet, you know, we were in all the big stores, you know, so we, we didn't we didn't face that quite a bit. But on the other hand, you had the CBA, the Christian Bookstore Association, that was taking these bands and just kind of keep them isolated. So you could never, you know, if you want to get a Christian metal band you had to go to a christian bookstore which a lot of people were not comfortable doing that and so you know thankful we were able to reach outside that a little bit but um as far as the the christians being accepted um that's why we like europe so much because europe never gave us that kind of um isolation that we had i mean our albums were being reviewed right next to bon jovi and and black sabbath i mean you know we're in the b category they didn't put us in the back of the magazine or you know, they, you know, there'd be a, a thing on bass players, and I'd be right up there with, you know, with rock, you know, it's just crazy. So we, we've we always loved going to Europe more because we didn't have that. We were called white metal because our message was positive. I said, well, it's only positive if you believe it. I think the isolation was a lot of the CBA's responsibility. And I think a lot of these kids or fans who were into it, they did. They kind of wanted to keep you for themselves. Right. But it was interesting that, right that you guys were you were able to draw big mainstream crowds in Europe and in Brazil as another place where yeah. metal stayed really popular for a long time. And part of that was because yeah. those markets didn't force the segregation. And that segregation was coming from both the church side and in America, the the secular side and the church side, you're saying. Yeah. And, and, you know, with Brazil or Latin America, you know, people have just discovered us on the Internet. There's no album pushing. There's no record labels. You know, all of our videos have been translated to Spanish or Portuguese, you know, so and we haven't done any of that. That's just all happened very organically through the Internet. So we love it. You know, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to play, you know, the Exodo Festival in Mexico twice. Now they've both been canceled. But, you know, so we have this big following in Mexico. Uh, Les and I did a podcast, like, I don't know, maybe it was Les or maybe it was just me, I don't remember. There was like 16,000 people on this podcast. It was crazy. And, you know, we never had a record company or distribution or anything down there. You know, the internet's been a blessing for us, at least, pretty much all the other acts. Because these kids, and his kid, these kids discover you for the first time. They like the lyrics, like the spirit behind it, and boom, you know. On behalf of those imprisoned by the state, or locked up by the shame of their own fate. Let me tell you. You can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits too. You can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits too. You can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits too. You can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits, you can be the rabbits too. Michael, if you could go back in time to the summer of 1986 and knowing what you know now, and and you are actually, you are a pastor at this point, um, what would you say to those guys in 316? If you, if, you were, if you were there, maybe they're about to leave with their manager on the road, what does Michael Bloodgood say to them as, he, as they go out on this journey? What, what advice would you give them? Uh, don't quit your day job. <laughs> Just kidding. You've got to stay in the Word of God. The God, Word of God has to be fundamental. It can't be ambiguous. It's got to be the authoritative controlling force in your world. And you need to stay there. You know, we always had Bible studies as a band. We always went to church on Sundays, even if we hadn't gotten any sleep on Saturday nights. We kept the main thing the main thing. Keeping Jesus at the center. Keeping the message about him at the center. Because you're going to get attacks from all sides of the of the you know the coin, remember where you go, and you have to just know that God's called you to do this, and this is what you're going to do, and you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Yeah, you know, that's the kind of mentality you have to have. Because you know, often we've been on the road, you know, our transmission is just broken down, our head gasket got blown, we have no money, we're in the middle of no place, you know, and we just go, what are we doing here? But we knew that God had called us to be there, and we had that assurance. Again, if your calling is true and, and your, your, your ministry is true, then God's going to get you to the other side. You have to just 
keep that keep it going stay in the word of god stay in prayer keep the simple things simple and god will show you uh you know how to get to the other side that's beautifully said that's great advice michael you guys have been faithful artistically excellent just good guys and you're entertaining and fun to talk to always and i just think that's an incredible legacy for for you and the guys and the band and as electric jesus comes out into the world we'll talk about blood good more uh as we go out into the world and it's it's cool to know we can hold you guys up as guys that were legit guys of the time but also like you're just you're just good men and um you've put together an incredible story and an incredible legacy so i'm i'm grateful for that and i feel uh proud and happy to know you well that's what can I say, man? All glory to God for that one, man. Let me just reiterate. If you have not seen the documentary Trenches of Rock um, about the band Bloodgood, about the experiences, some of which that Michael was just talking to us about. Uh, you really should see it. If if something in this podcast has made you interested in the whole Christian metal or rock scene, that one, you know, and if, if I'd seen that documentary before Electric Jesus, I may have just said, I don't need to make Electric Jesus. There's that documentary. Um, it's really good. It's really good. But now, like, having heard from Michael Bloodgood and previously Glenn Kaiser, is there anything that you heard from them that surprises you? Anything that you didn't expect when you were making mm. up a Christian metal band out of thin air? Well, you know, part of it is um, they have the benefit of telling their story many years later with a lot of wisdom and perspective that if we had interviewed them contemporary, you know, in the time... They probably would have. So I, I'm a huge fan of the wisdom and maturity that we we gain, hopefully, as we as we age. Um, there's just a sweetness to those guys, uh, a sincerity, a, a gentleness to their, or a simplicity even to their uh, acceptance of their faith, their understanding of it, and their sense of sharing it. In the, in the form of music that is just, I, I don't know, it's just sweet. Um, it, it's um, Even if you're cynical about that sort of thing, or even if you're a little skeptical about those tactics, which I definitely am. I, I, don't, I don't know that the best way to talk about God and, you know, uh, eternity with people is through it's through uh, hard rock. Maybe, maybe for some people it is. I don't know if it'd be my way of doing that, but um, or the way to reach me, maybe. But um, there is a sweetness and a sincerity to it that I that is just um, is surprising. You know, not that I thought they were uh, charlatans or fake about it. I just, I just, it's, it's, it's nice hearing them talk about it in a way that that isn't cynical at all. Um, cynicism of any kind is just a huge turnoff to me, and and I love their their um, the sweetness that they talk about it uh, with. So, anything about their stories that that was different than how you had imagined what life would have been like, or anything that that uh, I you know I thought. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think Daniel Smith kind of brought this up in the in the Glenn episode. Like, I just thought. I just thought they were lived more like rock stars. <laughs> I mean, like I just thought the buses were, you know, tripped out and sweet, and that you know they stayed at the five star hotel and, yeah, you know, ate prime rib every night that they wanted to, and you know, like I just had a you know as a teenager I thought this, and even I guess as an adult now that I realize it, thinking back on it, that rock star myth um, was. I, I just kind of thought that's what it was like back then. But I mean, both these guys are pretty clear on the fact that nope, wasn't like that. And and some of that may be because, you know, they would, you, you know, they came out on stage with the cool clothes and the cool right. hair and right. the, these instruments that look cool and these, right. 
you know, the light smoke. shows or <laughs> right. the presentation, yeah. it, it all looks cool. But, you know, when you're actually thinking about that, you know, it's like, well, you know, there there was probably one set of those cool clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, they and, smelled really, really bad. After, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Two and, days. You know, and like, yeah, yeah um, their hair, uh, you know, as long as it's long uh, and you got some hairspray, you can look like a rock star. So, you know, um, um, so yeah, I, I think the surprising thing that, to me and the details of it was, it was kind of like our movie where you're driving around in a hand-me-down RV if you're lucky. Right. And you're playing gigs in a lot of sketchy places and no one's really making that much money. Right. Um, if any so right. yeah i remember I, I will say like the the most surprising thing well one of the most surprising things for me was yeah finding out that when i was a kid finding out that my favorite rock stars couldn't afford to make a living even doing their music that people right. like michael rowe were paying the bills by being guitar teachers you know that some of my favorite mm. rock stars were janitors when they were off the road, you know, they were mm -hmm. carpenters or whatever. That was the first shocker. But then when I went and visited the Jesus People USA community where Glenn and Wendy and the Res Band people lived and where they ministered to homeless people, where they handed out clothes and meals, uh, and I actually walked around that place the first time, probably in about 1987, maybe 86, and I saw them in the halls with everybody else and everybody there looked like res band everybody there had kind of yeah. aging hippie <laughs> hair and kind of you know ragged looking clothes i was like oh wait those aren't stage clothes that's just how everybody here dresses yeah. i mean they, <laughs> they 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 were all wearing old like hand-me-down res shirts that you know hadn't sold from a previous tour and that kind of stuff oh, but right. they were yeah. all actually doing the stuff that they told us we should be doing they were there in the city in a bad neighborhood where bullets were flying, they were there, loving, unlovable people, giving their lives. And I, at 16, 17 years old, I was like, this is the most heavy metal punk rock thing I've ever seen. Like, th I've never seen a rock band, a secular, whatever you want to call it, rock band, living the rock and roll rebellion like this. This is it. And that, that sold me. That was like... This is the this is the most rock and roll thing I've ever seen, and yeah, this a, is this is the gospel, the gospel and rock and roll right here. This is it, you know. And I was gone. Yeah, well, that was it. That's a that's a really fascinating uh, perspective um, uh, that I don't think a lot of people uh, have, or I don't think a lot of people would uh, would think about it that way. I never because ever no saw matter that in a Christian bookstore. <laughs> no, and and whatever your religion or politics, whatever your issue right. was in right. any band uh to actually see bands living it out yeah. like actually or or any kind of celebrity or you know an endorsement or something uh to see people actually being like that when nobody's looking uh that would that would definitely make an impression on you for sure <laughs> but yeah blood good i mean michael blood good's uh awesome and yeah. uh if you're if you're curious about that band just the theatrics of that band uh, yeah. the the show that they the way they brought uh, if you're if you're a fan of that kind of music then you know the music's really strong but also they were they were delivering they knew that delivering a, a great show was part of um, you know their ethos and what they were trying to do and it it does I mean you can you can see trenches of rock again well yeah. let's make sure we we have that in the show notes you got to you got to catch a glimpse of that because it's it's really good. That's going to do it for this episode of the Electric Jesus Podcast. For more information about the Electric Jesus Film, visit electricjesusfilm.com and make sure to sign up for the email list, also known as the G's Team. You should also check out the Electric Jesus YouTube channel and Facebook groups for great behind-the-scenes videos, updated information about the film, and more. All links are available on the show notes page. 
This podcast is produced by myself, John J. Thompson, and Bruce A. Brown for Gyroscope Productions and is intended for the private use of our listening audience. Everything on the Electric Jesus podcast is used by permission or under fair use provisions and with the exception of previously copywritten materials is the intellectual property of Blue Tape Records, LLC, and is protected by U.S. copyright law. Next time on the Electric Jesus podcast, we take a slightly different type of look at this alternate reality music as we explore the subject of CCM from a more academic perspective and look at how it influenced church culture with author Leah Payne, a professor at Portland Seminary. I'm a historian of American religion, so I've studied the late 19th and early 20th and then all the way through the 20th century. I like to study weird religious movements. Um, And so CCM, I think, kind of Counts. Oh, what, what was the third one again? <laughs>